and share screen. Okay, cool. Everybody can see that? Cool? Yes. Okay, cool. Okay, so today uh, we're going to start talking about uh, hurricanes. So we, we've we most recently talked about flooding and a little bit about coastal flooding. Um, we're going to transition now to talking about these incredibly powerful um, weather events that are uh, ubiquitous across campus. And as always, I can't cross campus, <laughs> across the planet, man, it must be, I must be tired or something. Um, so uh, we're just going to start today and then we're going to actually continue this uh, next week with more in depth. Today is more just sort of like our first toe in the water and a little bit of a transition between um, our discussions of flooding and coastal flooding. And now we're talking about hurricanes. Um, and hurricanes are one of the key things that are going to be driving a lot of coastal uh, flooding um, when we look at just overall impacts and stuff. So um, first, uh, before we advance on, anybody have a guess as to what we're looking at here in terms of the background of this, this image? Is it like uh, storm patterns? Like each yep. line is a different... Uh... Yep. yep, exactly. Storm tracks. Storm tracks. Yeah, absolutely. So these are... This is, um, uh, we have this conversation with all of our disaster categories, all our, our, our types of disasters, but, um, you know, we frequently hear, I've never heard, um, or, 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 or I never thought this would happen. If we're talking about the wildfire, if we're talking about the, the river flooding or what have you. Um, in the end, it, uh, it, it uh, is, might be hard to believe, but um, with hurricanes, we hear the same thing over and over again. Um, in the last few years with the intensity and the magnitude of hurricanes, we're, we're getting this a bit less, but, but this is the reality. So this is, um, these are historic storm tracks from, uh, let's see, this is about the, since about 1870, I think this plot here is, I can't remember, or is this 1950? No, this might be 1950, I think it's 1950 onward. Um, and so these are our are, are cyclonic storms. We'll talk about that. But, but um, a spectrum from not very strong to strong, which we in our part of the world use the term hurricanes, to really strong or what we would call major hurricanes. All of those things are here. And what you see is pretty common for places like Florida, um, the eastern seaboard, to experience um, these storm events. It's, it's just part of life, right? It's part of reality. Um, what we sometimes forget though here on the West Coast, um, because we don't routinely deal with uh, hurricanes proper, we tend to deal with the, the dregs of the hurricanes, the, the, the remnant rain and, and some of the ancillary winds and things of that nature and some of the swells. Um, but uh, you know, we do have hurricanes in our part of the world too, um, they just tend to hit more southerly in our part of the continent than our colleagues um, in Mexico and, and uh, the rest of the US experience. But we, we still get hurricanes here. Um, and so, uh, and, and, and can experience the remnants of hurricanes and with increasingly um, crazy climate, we are starting, or it's predicted that we're, we will see more of these um, hurricanes strike us here in Ventura County. And so um, while still we're, we're getting um, not, not the main strike in Ventura County, we're getting sort of the, the aberrant one that might um, impact us. Nevertheless, um, with climate change, this is expanding all over, <clears throat> excuse me, the range is expanding all over the world. And so, so we're catching some of that. Too. These are sometimes called spaghetti diagrams or spaghetti plots. Um, uh, again, these are the actual storm tracks. When we're predicting a hurricane, we might get something similar. It won't be quite as many of these, but they'll be because um, we use multiple models to try to forecast. And so you can get uh, several different storm tracks um, in, the, in the lead up to, say, landfall of a hurricane. 
And uh, so you'll see the same sort of uh, visualization. Um, in this case, this is realized storm tracks. In the case of predictions, we're, we're forecasting best guesses as terms in terms of storm tracks. Okay, so a little quick uh, a video here just to sort of start to set, set the mood. And I think this little brief video from NOAA really does um, it sort of in 30 seconds or so, we'll, we'll sort of uh, grab some of the visuals for us. The spaghetti dagger. Oh, that's actually a track. These are tracks of hurricanes. Okay. Okay, cool. So um, before we get into talking about hurricanes, let's set the stage. Let's set the stage. So I want to talk about a few. Um, uh, examples of historic hurricanes and how important these storms have been in human history. Hurricanes have been going on since before there were humans here on the planet Earth. Um, and we tend to really focus on the last year, the last decade, the last century, where we have really good data, really rigorous um, objective measurements of the strength and the magnitude and the impact, which makes total sense. But um, there is a, a growing field of research where people are trying to um, uh, look at major hurricanes and, and hurricane impacts um, before we had really good rigorous records. And so I'll just go through a few of these that, um, uh, and, and just a few examples to sort of, again, talk about how important and how consequential these storms can be. First example I have here is the Mongols in China uh, trying to invade Japan. So there's this historic animosity between the people in Japan, the people in China, um, and uh, sort of always going after each other. So uh, Kublai Khan tries to invade Japan first tries it in 1274, sends a bunch of ships across from the mainland of Asia to the island of Japan, lands there, starts to do the typical fighting all these male dominated societies love to do. And, uh, you know, smacking on each other, smacking on each other. And this big um, army of samurai, Japanese warriors, uh, uh, are able to repel the Mongol hordes and they and so the, the Mongols get back in their ships and they start to retreat, thinking they just do a small retreat. And uh, a typhoon, which we'll talk about in a second, which is just another word for a hurricane, typhoon hits them and and decimates the fleet. Huge problem. So they the, the survivors limp back to to mainland China. They recoup. They they get stuff together. In the meantime. Uh, the Japanese start building these really intense coastal defenses. So, so areas where it would be easy to land, they make it very hard for these barriers in the way. So um, a few years later in 1281, when the Mongols come back, they can't really land. And so they're trying to land, but all these places make it very difficult to land their large forces. And this was a huge force. Now this is a little bit controversial. So some historians have debated this, but but there was a massive fleet. So so the Mongols were so embarrassed. They said this time we're bringing everything. So th the lore was this was the largest maritime. Um, it's, it's 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 interesting to me in that uh, you know we love to talk about the biggest and the longest and the tallest and all that kind of stuff. Um, but but uh, one of the things that I've there, 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 it's an interesting observation I've made over the years, particularly related to disasters, um, is and weather is uh, the sort of largest fleets of the world. Like who had the biggest fleet? So this massing of supposedly as much as four thousand ships was the largest armada uh, known until the D-Day invasion of World War II. So this was a, this was a huge, you know. Whether it was exactly 4,000 ships or not, the point was it was thousands of vessels. 
going from China. So they can't quite land in Japan. They're bumping around. And then a big giant storm comes in, a big giant typhoon, and sinks virtually all the ships, right? So somewhere on the order of 100,000, 150,000 people, the number here is 140,000. But again, historians now are, are kind of questioning the exact number, but, but a lot, a lot of folks. And so, so again, Japan is saved. The term that uh, is, is used is kamikaze or divine wind. And this becomes a very uh, important um, a cultural aspect in Japan. And it leads to China uh, not trying to invade Japan for, for centuries, right? And, and the kamikaze term is re resurrected in World War II when Japan um, wants to uh, inspire and all that kind of stuff. So, so um, huge impacts of this one or two storms um, and lots of consequences, for example, in the continent of Asia. Next, we can talk about a um, uh, couple hundred years later, let's move over to the Caribbean. And uh, Columbus, uh, as he's voyaging and supposedly discovering America, even though there's already people here and even though the Vikings already came and everything, but you know, we'll set that aside for a second. But, but at least for modern Europe, uh, uh, finds the route to the Americas. Um, he really brings the idea of hurricanes to Western Europe and to essentially Western uh, awareness, uh, uh, Western culture, as we would describe it. So um, how does he do that? On his very first voyage, when he gets to the island of Hispaniola, he hangs out and starts talking with the natives before he starts slaughtering them and committing genocide and enslaving everybody and all that. He's talking to them. So he essentially absorbs some of their, what we would now maybe call traditional ecological knowledge about something that he didn't know. So they talked about um, animals behaving strangely. Probably they didn't understand barometric pressure and, and atmospheric pressure. Probably that's what was going on. Uh, long swells, so very long period waves um, in the ocean. The sky in the morning before a big storm comes, uh, a red brick, you know, sort of deep, deep uh, brick colored uh, sunsets and sunrises and things of that nature. And so he absorbs all this kind of stuff, makes his notes. He goes on to do all his genocide and slaughtering of peoples and evil colonization and all of that. Um, and he, he makes several voyages to the so-called new world. On uh, his, uh, one of his, his, his previous voyages before the fourth voyage that we're gonna talk about in a second, um, he establishes a fort, the fort is destroyed. He comes back on his third voyage and he says, hey, I'm gonna fix this up. And he's basically a total a-hole, right? So Columbus, fantastic sailor, a-hole of a person. And, um, and uh, just ticks everybody off, right? I mean, he just offends everybody, even the, the colonists, he's just an a-hole, such that he gets put in chains and sent back to Spain uh, in the brig, right? So you don't hear that a lot when we talk about the story of Columbus, but, but that's what happens. So then he, uh, you know, because he's a powerful dude um, and, and uh, has all this notoriety, uh, Isabella and Ferdinand, give him more money to, to come back. So he comes back on this fourth voyage, but they say, hey, dude, don't go to Hispaniola, right? You've, you've, you've ticked everybody off there, super bad news. We don't wanna stir up. We just go do these other horrible colonial things, right? Be, be horrible elsewhere was the, essentially the order. And so, um, so he goes, but as he's approaching the island, he starts to perceive these signals of a hurricane. He you know, starts to get these swelly kind of conditions and he goes, oh my God. So he says, hey, we gotta go, he and his fleet, we have to go in, and this is in 1502, we have to go in and, and, and anchor up in the harbor and it, where this protected anchorage is so our ships will be safe because there's a storm coming. So he asks, asks if he can go in and, and, and the governor there hates him, right? So the governor there, the colonial governor remembers what happened on his last voyage and everybody hates this dude. So the governor goes, no, you can't come into port here. 
And so Columbus says, no, no, you don't understand. There's going to be a massive storm. And in port at the same time, getting ready to leave is this treasure fleet. Gold, silver, all the stuff the pirates want and all that kind of jazz, um, laden with treasures that the, that the colonial powers have looted from the native peoples. Um, and so they're getting ready to send it back to Europe and uh, send it back to Spain. And um, so uh, Columbus says, yo, 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 don't send that fleet out, right? There's 24 ships, these galleons, don't send them out. Uh, there's gonna be a storm. And the governor says, get the hell out of here. And two, screw you, we can do what we want. So uh, Columbus's fleet has to, has to keep going and they find safe anchorage farther down the coast in a, in a protected embayment. The governor sends out the treasure fleet, um, 24 ships, almost all destroyed. Almost all destroyed. The one, a few limp back to, to port there. Only one ship makes it all the way through and keeps going all the way back to Europe. Um, that's the uh, uh, Aguaha, uh, Aguaha. Um, uh, and that <laughs> ironically is the one that had, so, so, um, Columbus was going to get paid for all his explorations for Ferdinand and Isabella and stuff. Right. Uh, and so, uh, his portion of the payment in this blood money and, and pilfered, uh, precious metals and things is on that ship. So the one ship that has his stuff makes it back to Europe. Everybody else's sinks or is lost right so now it becomes this whole thing and people say oh my god uh columbus is a is a wizard right and and he intentionally did this also the dude that prosecuted him and put him into chains is killed uh so 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 it just sort of makes this huge lore around columbus but importantly it also really brings home this idea of hurricanes and 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 people in europe start taking this idea of hurricanes much more seriously. From the same era, that's where we get our term hurricane. So there's a similar, it's unclear where it exactly comes from. Uh, the Tiano and on uh, Hispaniola or the Mayan, there's all these cultures in the Caribbean basin, the greater Caribbean, um, that, you, that essentially have the same word or very similar word. And we translate it in English ultimately into hurricane. And so the term comes from the, the various cultures, gods, the god of storms, the god of, of wind, all that kind of stuff. And so, so this, this uh, sort of dramatic story with Columbus really interjects the idea of hurricanes and these destructive storms uh, into uh, the wider public understanding. Uh, next one, uh, does that make sense so far, you guys? Questions so far? Cool. It's making sense. Okay. Next, another couple hundred years farther on, the Great Hurricane of 1780. This is still the most destructive uh, hurricane in our part of the world, hands down, that we know of. Um, so this strikes the Lesser Antilles, right? That, that area of the Caribbean that's sort of uh, closest towards Africa and Europe. Um, and very hard to get accurate numbers, um, you know, back in the day. but the guesstimates are somewhere on the order of about 22,000 people are killed by this one storm. And, and uh, this is the so-called Great Hurricane of 1780. But I'm gonna mention it because um, uh, this is the time of the American Revolution. Uh, the powers that are operating in North America, uh, you know, wintertime storms, bad, bad times. So they would send their ships down to the Caribbean to, to hang out during um, you know, the most craziest uh, uh, hurricane seasons oftentimes. And so, um, uh, or, 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 you know, yeah, right, I'll just say that. And so, uh, so at this time, there's all these different powers, right? There's Spanish colonies, there's French colonies, there's English colonies, et cetera. And so this hurricane hits when the French and English fleets down in the Caribbean are, are hanging out and, and replenishing, uh, fixing their sails and all that kind of jazz. Both the French and the English fleets, fleets are impacted, but the British fleet is particularly strongly whacked. 
So it's something like, I think they lose, I can't remember, something like uh, 12, 12 ships sink completely and nine are severely broken. You know, so it's, it's, a, it's a pretty major impact on these giant vessels. Um, and so, so the British fleet basically hangs out uh, or portions of them head back to Europe to, to get refitted and, and, and get better. So as a consequence, the French, who are also whacked but not whacked as badly, are able to get the jump on them. And so, so they sail up. And recall that in this fight between the, the Americans and the British, the French were kind of hanging out for a while, trying to, and the French didn't like us so much as they hated the British, right? And so this was a proxy war for the French. And so, um, so basically uh, the, the French general, de Grasse, Lieutenant General, um, uh, is able to, to grab his fleet, take off, and the British normally would try to follow him and, and, and stay, stay with him and whatever. They can't follow him. So the French get up and go into the Chesapeake and, and anchor up and, and fortify themselves before the British know what's up. So as a consequence, when the Americans are fighting at Yorktown, the British are trying to reinforce their troops, but because the French are blockading the landing there and occupying the Chesapeake Bay, they cannot. So um, in a very real sense, this hurricane really helped speed um, the victories of the American rebels in the revolution and help foster the, the surrendering of Cornwallis at Yorktown, which wasn't the end of the Revolutionary War, but it was, it was a massive turning point. So we have hurricanes to at least partially thank for that. Another example of, of how consequential hurricanes can be was this hurricane from 1899. Uh, so you know, 100 years or so after we've just been talking about it again. And uh, while this impacted the region, we're going to talk about Puerto Rico. Okay, so, so the, that, that last example, this example, we're talking about the Atlantic hurricanes. And so, um, uh, okay, uh, we're talking about Puerto Rico. Uh, this story here is one of colonialism and systemic castes and 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 segregation and slavery and all that kind of stuff that has happened historically uh, in our culture. Spain comes over, takes over the this island, and is in is in control of the island from 1508. Um, and they institute slavery, they institute plantations, all the horrible evils that we know about. Um, and they're in control for hundreds of years. By the mid 1800s, there's increasing efforts to organize laborers because things are getting worse and worse um, in terms of uh, 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 poverty and disenfranchisement of groups and things of that nature. Uh, 1873 comes around and there's a republic that is formed, meaning local elected, local control of the territory. Um, and one of the things they do there is outlaw slavery, but that lasts for less than a year. Then a military junta comes in and, and you know, back to, back to far away control. Um, and then the Americans, um, stoked by people like Teddy Roosevelt and others say, hey, we want some land. So let's go invade, um, let's go invade Cuba and Puerto Rico and the Philippines. And so we, the Americans instigate the Spanish American war. And, uh, and we have a brief, brief battles. And so 1899 uh, rolls around and uh, Puerto Rico becomes a protectorate of the US. It's not formally a territory, it's a protectorate. So these people are not considered American citizens at this point, um, but now we're in control. So now we have an American military governor in the wake of a war in control of this island and, and um, trying to deal with all these all these issues. The other aspect that was going on before this San Sirocco hurricane hits um, is uh, increasing role of the export economy. It, Puerto Rico used to be able to feed itself, no problemo. Very verdant island, lots of things grow there. Um, you know, was it was an was an exporter of food. By this point, the island has become a commodity market, meaning we're exporting only uh, stuff for sale and, and uh, in international markets. 
coffee and sugar primarily. And then with the money from coffee and sugar, then we buy food and import food to our island. The food used to be produced <clears throat> by many, many small scale farms, uh, you know, uh, peasant farms, um, um, uh, subsistence farming, that kind of stuff all throughout the island. But this is getting replaced by these larger corporate entities. Um, uh, right, okay, good. So then um, the hurricane strikes. At the time, Puerto Rico is about a bit more than half a million folks, residents of the whole island. Um, and uh, the, the official tally is 3,433. It was clearly more than that, but it was at least 3,433 people are dead. And importantly, massive devastation. So sometimes hurricanes will glance an area, meaning sort of bump on a, 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 a part of a state or a, a country or whatever. Other times they hit it dead on. That's what happened in this case. So the entirety of the island was impacted by this hurricane. And so, uh, so it, it you know, had, of course, consequences throughout the island, hurt the whole island, hurt the urban areas. But in particular, for our conversation today, it whacked the rural infrastructure, roads, uh, uh, telegraph wires, all that stuff, and uh, was really messed up. Initially, as we see with most of our disasters, initially in the, in the hours and initial days, um, there's lots of together. Everybody's helping everybody because everybody's screwed, right? The rich people are screwed. The poor people are screwed. Um, we're looking for bodies and trying to pull people off from rubble, that type of stuff. And so that we start that way. Uh, initially, the governor, the military governor at the time says, okay, in the wake of this horrible storm, um, and already people were, were food insecure, as we would say today, this just made it even worse. So all the, the food stocks that were uh, you know, stored in warehouses that were destroyed or, or greatly destroyed. Um, and so, so there was huge need, huge need for food, et cetera. So the governor issues these um, essentially vouchers that anybody can get um, you know, foodstuffs and, and some bacon and, and fish and things of that nature. But then very quickly, the existing parts of society, the existing assumptions and biases um, rear their heads. And so this, this idea of in this very segregated caste society that, um, oh, the poor are late. Why are the poor poor? Oh, they're poor because they're lazy. They're poor because they're stupid. They're poor because they don't want to work. And so all these horrible tropes start to reemerge. And instead of just letting anybody get food, the idea is, well, you have to work. <clears throat> if you're not working, you're lazy. And if you're lazy, you're not contributing to recovery. So therefore, you don't get food, right? Um, and, and that's what dominates the response. And that <clears throat> tends to further marginalize people, further put people on, uh, in, on a precarious footing and it, and it gets really um, more difficult. In response, to after, after it starts to become apparent that there's lots of problems, um, the military governor turns to the big plantations, the coffee and the sugar plantations, and, and essentially starts running food and things of that nature through them. Uh, the US government, our government, we own that, we own that land at that point, um, we are very slow with aid. We, we don't really send money. We send a, a couple million dollars in tax and um, um, a sort of money we collect from tariffs and it, we, we just don't do a lot. So as a consequence, we set the island on this course of never really fully recovered infrastructure wise. And we see the consequences of this repeated over and over again, including most recently um, in the eight, in the, 80s and 90s with the messed up infrastructure, which lays the groundwork for when Hurricane Maria hits in the last few years and, and causes that. So, so the other thing about these, these historic hurricanes and hurricanes in general and disasters in general, I suppose, at, that, at this point, um, these pre-existing problems can be intensified. And Puerto Rico is a classic example of that. Um, another uh, uh, classic example of historic uh, hurricanes the Galveston hurricane of 1900. Um, so this is uh, Galveston, Barrier Island, Texas. This is the place in Texas. This is the San Francisco of Texas, if I can use that term. 
so one, one, one of the things I always note uh, when these up and coming uh, towns are were, were popping up in the in the 1800s and things in the US is you look to see if they have an opera house. If they have an opera house, they have culture, right? That, that, that's a cultural mecca. Like who the hell has an opera house? The cultural places do. The places with rich culture that are pulling in people from other parts of the world and all this and that. And, and these, these uh, sort of backwater rural places that are trying to assert themselves and argue that they should be at the table with, with the other more established places. So uh, Galveston, turn of the century, has orphanages, has um, uh, opera houses, uh, all this kind of stuff. It is the largest city in Texas with more than 40,000 people living there and is absolutely the economic center and the political uh, power center of Texas. Now, again, this is, this is on a barrier island. Can anybody remind me what a barrier island is? Can anybody remember? Very different from what we have here in California. Isn't that like a small landmass off the coast that kind of acts as a, a, a storm break? Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's, it's uh, like almost like a, a big sandbar, right? So we here on the West Coast have a geologically very young coast. So our coast goes up and down, right? We're very steep. Um, and so it's, it's very hard for us to get islands. We have very few islands, for example, off the coast of California. And the islands we do have, like the, the uh, uh, Channel Islands, are essentially just a continuation of the, of the terrestrial mountain. They're basically rock islands, right? Whereas in other parts of the world that have a much shallower um, benthos, a much shallower bottom of the ocean, like the uh, eastern seaboard, like the Gulf Coast, um, it's much easier for sediments, sand, etc., to build up and to actually build up to the point where they actually break the surface and, and form an island. And so those sand-based sediment dynamic um, structures just off the mainland are uh, referred to as barrier islands. And so so yeah, so Galveston was on a sand island. Galveston is in um, Galveston Bay, uh, and so in the uh, in the uh, Gulf of Mexico. And these people are living uh, and building these incredible buildings, uh, churches, cathedrals, etc., just a few feet above high tide. The other thing to to realize before we get into this, just by way of reminding everyone, so we're on the same page, um, we have a, a relatively um, large um, a tidal range. So we can have a high tide of three feet and a low tide of three feet or even more, right? Four or five at times uh, here in California in a single day. This part of the world, Texas, is more like a foot or two is their tidal range, right? So one, much flatter geography. Two, the typical day in, day out tides are much less um, are, are, are much reduced. Okay, so you have people hanging out there. Um, uh, this, uh, uh, when the hurricane strikes, it kills at least 6,000 people. We'll never know um, because there's lots of visitors and things of that nature. Some of the estimates are up to 8,000, 10,000 people, a lot of folks. So I mentioned that the, the hurricane of 1780 in, in the Americas is the most deadly, is, it was the deadliest hurricane we know of. In terms of the United States proper, the mainland United States, the Galveston hurricane, right, more than 120 years ago, still is the deadliest hurricane that we've experienced. And long story short, the city never recovers. There's still, a, there's still a town of Galveston, and if you go there, people will say, hey, we're doing great, but no. It's, it, it never came back. Um, it, it came back, but not to the extent that it was. Um, the business leaders, the power brokers realized, hey, this place is sketch, and they left. And they, they pull up tent stakes, and they move north to Houston. So that's why we have the Houston Texans, right? A football team. That's why the oil and gas industry is based, the energy industry is based in Houston as opposed to Galveston, right? So, so the city is just never going to be the same. The theme here, in addition to sometimes we just never recover from these, from these um, events, other key theme is that warnings were very much so ignored. Um, 
uh, very easy to be Monday morning quarterback with, with hurricanes and other disasters. But in this case, there really what were signs. So for example, the island was previously flooded by storms in 1875 and 1886. Not as bad as the Galveston uh, hurricane, but nevertheless, they were flooded. And, and the idea was, oh, our ankles got a little wet, so we'll, we'll be able to you know, um, you know, suffer through whatever comes. The very um, rudimentary emerging field of meteorology at the time um, was arguing that destructive waves probably weren't possible, and uh, people were proposing uh, flood protection, seawalls, barriers, things of that nature around the perimeter of the island. But a lot of the, the technical folks were saying, ah, that would be wasted. We could do that, but that, it's not gonna give us any extra benefit. We don't need it. So let's, so the initial proposals before 1900 to add protections were ignored. Indeed, Isaac Klein, there's a fantastic book called Isaac Storm, if you guys are interested in this, this one. Uh, Isaac Klein, uh, a couple years earlier in the local newspaper said, uh, you know, the head meteorologist said it wasn't, big storms weren't a problem. And he said, you know, only two of the 20 storms in the last 20 years hit the Texas coast, and those two were weird. So therefore, this is an unlikely event. One might have flipped that and said, hey, so 10% uh, of the storms hit Texas? Maybe that's uh, something we should worry about. But again, this notion of how we perceive risk, how we understand um, potential threats from disasters <clears throat> rears its head. Um, when the, when the um, hurricane hit, the storm surge was at least 15 feet. The highest point on the island at this point is only 8.7 feet above uh, mean sea level. Storm surge is at least 15 feet with it some, at some points at some locations probably reported as greater than 20 or 21 feet. Um, so we'll, 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 we'll talk about storm surge in a, in a little bit, but I'll just remind you guys that storm surge is not a wave. Storm surge is the rising of the sea level and the staying of the sea at that level for an extended period of time. So it's not a whoop whoop, it is a underwater situation. And so essentially, um, most of the island was underwater with the exception of a few hillocks or you know, some of the taller you know, three-story buildings or something of that nature. Again, seawalls, which were proposed pre-storm, which are a mechanical barrier, an artificial barrier we put between the ocean and the land. Uh, usually on the on the upper edge of a beach, um, were ignored. But after after the the uh, hurricane hit in 1902, um, they started building a three mile long, 16 feet deep, 17 foot high seawall, which is subsequently which subsequently helps defend the island from a, 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 um, hurricanes that come in the subsequent years and is expanded all the way into the 1960s where it's now about a 10 mile wide continuous concrete buffer. Um, so all kinds of ecological degradation and stuff from that, but, but uh, that's what is needed. And, and they dredge sand from the channel, nearby channel, Galveston Bay, enough to raise the entirety of the island eight feet up in the air. Right, so so everything is raised. In addition to armoring the edges, everything is raised. So so Galveston is a massively engineered island now. It, it, it differs quite substantially from the ecological functioning and the ecological services that most um, barrier islands uh, barrier islands provide, and it is is a basically an engineered structure now. Uh, the last thing to say here is that the very just early in the days of its existence, the Weather Bureau, at the, what was called the Weather Bureau at the time, um, uh, uninformed, they were getting signals from Cuba and elsewhere, there was a storm coming, but the bureaucracy didn't let, the, it had to go to DC, and then DC had to decide if they could send out warnings to, to warn the, the areas that the storm was coming, and they, their default policy was, we better not do this, because this will scare people. Um, so there, so the people were uninformed. Uh, the people that were getting data were misinterpreting the data, and it was just a huge cluster um, and, and, and very uh, 
um, uh, not good at predicting what was going to go 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 on, and not good at warning people as to what was going to go on. And this helped spark a major overhaul of our approaches to warnings, our approaches to predictions. In fact, one of the guys in the DC office um, who said, "Hey, I think looking at some of the data, I think this might mean a big hurricanes coming to Texas," and was overridden by his uh, superiors. Eventually. Uh, gets uh, and in the wake of this gets promoted and starts to have more power and so helps um, uh, more professionalize and make more rigorous the science of hurricane prediction etc uh, for the U.S. government. Uh, so we'll just end with a couple of pictures here from Galveston. So this is uh, in the wake uh, left. You see there's this church standing, but everything else is sort of nuked around it. Um, this picture here on the lower left is the one I always think of when I think of the Galveston um, hurricane. And as far as you can see, basically everything is leveled, right? Um, so hurricanes are wind events in addition to storm surge. And, and people were not building uh, uh, structures to withstand these intense, intense winds. And on the right, what you see is a, 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 a cart full of bodies. So this is the tropics, remember, this is, this is the, the warm uh, parts of, the, of our planet in the warm times of the year. And so these bodies start to decay. So it becomes a huge challenge to um, just from a public health, for, first to find people, secondly, to deal with the bodies. They first started throwing the bodies in the ocean, burials at sea, they started washing back up. Um, so they eventually very quickly start to just burn the bodies. And so identifying people becomes very hard because as soon as a body is found, it's burnt. Um, and, and so it's, you, know, you can imagine the challenge that that, that provided for people that are looking for their family members, uh, people that are trying to establish death. It's just a huge, crazy um, situation and a horrible, horrible situation. On the lower right is a postcard, a colorized postcard um, uh, in the wake of the um, storm where they're actually constru beginning construction of this seawall around the entirety of, or at least initially around the frontage part of the island, eventually would go around 10 miles of the island. Um, the seawall works, but it is increasingly being tested. This is um, a few hours before Hurricane Ike strikes, and you can see uh, that uh, the waves, even with this strong barrier, um, even just, and this is just a category two hurricane with a direct hit, even these protections um, can be tested at times. Okay, so that, so that, so, so I think from that we can all take away that hurricanes have been consequential for our society locally, regionally, and in terms of on the international stage. So hurricanes are very, very consequential, can be very, very consequential uh, events. I just want to play this. This is another little quick, just minute or minute and a half or so video. Uh, in this case, this one's from Time, but I like it. This is talking specifically about modeling. But I like it because it, it sort of puts a lot of the imagery that we typically see with hurricanes um, together. But before I, before I go on to play this, um, any questions about some of those um, consequential hurricanes? There's many more. I just listed a few. But those examples make sense. Any questions about, about that? Nope. OK. OK, cool. So. Um, so let's take a look at this quick video here for a second. Many experts in the U.S. have called for hurricanes and scientific ways to predict dangerous storms. The weather forecasting model at the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasts famously foresaw that Superstorm Sandy would smash into the East Coast, even as the U.S. model called the Polar Vortex System was still projecting no land. Since then, the relative accuracy of the so-called Euro model has only gotten more publicity, putting American weather pros under scrutiny. Prominent weather service reports put the number of U.S. weather-related deaths in 2017 at 508, a figure that doesn't include unofficial estimates of 100 or more fatalities from Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico. The next generation weather forecast model, called FB3, is about to become a linchpin for U.S. meteorologists. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, not only expects to improve the reliability of forecasts for the 30-day event, but also 
also foresees increasing success with subseasonal and seasonal forecasts. On May 24th, NOAA issued its 2018 hurricane season forecast, predicting a 70% chance that there will be 10 to 16 named storms, of which 5 to 9 could become hurricanes, including 1 to 4 major hurricanes. Given how accurate forecasts have already become, many weather experts believe that the health advances will come from finding better ways of communicating them and getting people to act on them. Cool. So I, I think I think that little video, I like that video because it it sort of there's there's the drone imagery, there's the people walking through flooded waters, there's the, the scientists in their bunker working on models, this sort of all the the modern imagery of hurricanes um that we that we typically sort of see in the news feeds um when we look at these the, these events. Um okay, so uh we'll start with this and then I think we'll take our, our break in a second, but let me just uh begin uh, with saying that um, hurricanes, what are these hurricanes? These hurricanes are cyclonic storms, storms that, that, that spin around the, the, a center. Uh, we call these things, in our parts of the world, we call these things hurricanes, as we just talked about the origin of the name a little bit ago. So a hurricane is one of these storms that whacks us on the eastern seaboard or in the Atlantic, or in the western, uh, coming from the, the, the western part or landing on the western part of North America and in our part of the Pacific, hurricanes. If we go down to, say, Australia area, there we use the term cyclone. Uh, if we go up to uh, Japan, Middle East, that area, Asia, um, there we call those typhoons all the same exact thing. These are just different cultural terms for the same phenomenon. The only real difference is that in the Northern Hemisphere, all these storms spin counterclockwise. And in the Southern Hemisphere, they spin clockwise. Everything else, same thing. Um, the, the, the processes that initiate them, um, the conditions that have to be met for them to, to grow and, and expand, et cetera, are all the same. So we'll so from here on out, we'll we'll talk about hurricanes, but realize that we can um, swap the term cyclone or typhoon. Same exact science, same exact uh, uh, underlying stuff. The next thing I'll say just before we take our break is that what we what we see in these. So I, again, I usually use the term hurricane. But if we use these terms, tropical depression, um, uh, uh, tropical storm, these are all just different degrees, different intensities of the same phenomenon. So a tropical depression is the start of one of these uh, storms, and it's sort of it's, it's it's just starting. It hasn't really hasn't really formed at the, the the spinning center and that kind of stuff yet. But it's it's starting to. It's sort of getting ready to. It's sort of sort of like yanking on the the pull string of the outboard motor. Oh, oh, I misspelled tropical. That's lame. Trop tropical. That should be tropical. Uh, so um, uh, then, then if that progresses, if that gets stronger, um, that forms a tropical storm, what we would call as a storm, right? So, so there we go. And then as this storm intensifies, once the winds get to at least 74 miles per hour for at least one minute, uh, or, or when we're measuring it, um, uh, that becomes a so-called hurricane. And in the categorization that we use, um, we would call that a category one. Uh, there's category one through five. Once we get to category three, that's referred to as a major hurricane. And, and, and what makes one a category one or two or three? Um, historically, it is the, the wind speed. So for, for a major hurricane, that means we have sustained wind speeds for at least a minute of 111 miles per hour. And, and so, so depression to storm to hurricane to major hurricane, same phenomenon, same underlying physics, same underlying meteorology. It's just an intensification that, that as we get lower and lower on that list. Cool. 
Um, I think we're just about ready uh, for our breaks. I think we'll, we'll take our uh, 10 minute pause here, uh, unless anybody has any questions so far. Do you have any questions about intro to hurricanes? No, okay, cool. So uh, we'll take a quick pause. Uh, I'll see everybody in 10 minutes.